Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. I was reminded this week of us being brothers and sisters. And uh, my grandson was studying the covenant made with Abraham that his offspring would be as numerous as the stars. So my grandson is riding with his mother and there is one of those clear nights and he looks out misunderstanding the covenant with Abraham. He says, Mama, are we going to have that many children? She said, no, we're not going to have that many children. But what an opportunity to think about we are all brothers and sisters in the Lord and we have the opportunity to open the book of books the book that I believe is inerrant infallible, reliable helpful, it is our sustenance, it is a word that changes us by the spirit and so we're going to do something we do occasionally we're going to stand and read our text this morning, Jesus praying for himself and his mission so let's stand and let's do that together from John 17 the high priestly prayer so follow along if you would when Jesus had spoken these words join me he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said father the hour has come glorify your son that the son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him and this is eternal life that they know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent I glorified you on earth having accomplished the work that you gave me to do and now father glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world yours they were and you gave them to me and they have kept your word now they know that everything that you have given me is from you for I have given them the words that you gave me and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you and they believed that you sent me pray with me father in heaven we embark on holy ground as we look at the words of Jesus in the high priestly prayer before he is about to go to the brutal cross. And we pray that we will take to heart these words and the meditations of our heart will be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A number of years ago, there was a business, a brokerage business. Many of you might remember it. It was called E.F. Hutton. If you remember that, they had a cliche, a saying. You may say a sound bite that was remembered by many. By the way, E.F. Hutton, I don't think is in business anymore. I think they went bankrupt. But here's what they said when they would advertise E.F. Hutton. When E.F. Hutton talks, what is, what's the rest of it? People listen. Now, I believe this morning in John 17 that we have a group of disciples listening to Jesus and they're riveted that they are listening with the greatest of intentness and Jesus knowing all things begins to preach almost in the, his prayer as he's informing them of what is about to happen in John 16 he's been telling them that he's going to go away for a while the hour has come we see that again in John 17 the hour has come which referred to the hour that would bring to completion or bring to fruition his mission on the earth. So if you have your Bibles, turn with us to John 17, staying there, and we're going to begin with verse 1. Just kind of unpack this, maybe in a, in a way that we don't usually look at Scripture, but this text is a progression. It's not like Paul's writings where Paul can give you like three arguments for justification or he can give you an argument for sanctification or he can connect sanctification. But in Jesus' words, we have him, the Lord Jesus, recorded by John in a progressive way talking about this prayer he has, explaining it of sorts. And so... 
We'll go with John 17, 1. We'll start there. When Jesus had spoken these words, that's 15 and 16, probably of John, he lifted his eyes, which had been an Old Testament reference to how they prayed. So that's why we believe this is the start of his prayer with three parts. He's going to pray for himself and his mission. He's going to pray for his disciples. Then he's going to pray for us. And we'll look at that in three weeks. We're just going to do part one today, and we might just get through the first five verses. So, he's praying, and then he says, first point, the first petition is, Father, the hour has come. Then he says, here's the petition, here's the ask, glorify your Son. I was struck by this. How prayerless I am. And here's the living Son of God saying, Father, the hour has come. And look at his petition. Glorify the Son. He's not fatalistic saying this is going to happen. He's not negligent to say let's just plow through this. He begins to pray in this deep, heartfelt relationship with the Father, saying, the hour has come, now glorify your Son. He knows what God's sovereign will is. He's in God's sovereign will. And here's something for all of us. He knows that God's sovereign will is coming to fruition. He's going to give his life. He's going to go to the cross. He's going to be raised from the dead. He's going to provide eternal life which comes in a minute and here he is knowing the sovereignty of God and he's praying I know too many Christians who say well I know that God's sovereign I heard one this week and so I'm going to just cruise or be a couch potato here's Jesus being an example the sovereign work of God should never make us resign to well God's got it in hand here it ignites prayer in the Lord Jesus praying for God to be glorified and himself to be glorified now think about it how could a cross bring glory to anyone so he's saying even in his suffering God will be glorified so here's another lesson there's a lot of lessons in here I just prayed through this Lord give us some lessons that when we're in suffering which we've all been and you might be in there right today that you glorify God how? by being utterly dependent for him to take you and I through it and that glorifies the Father that's the example here And of course, Jesus knows the cross isn't the end of the story. But he knows he's going to be glorified. He knows that God will get the glory. If you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians. By the way, to glorify means to show the splendor, the greatness, the wonder, the awe of someone. And from the beginning of time, God's redemptive plan, which we're talking about now, was for his glory. Ephesians chapter 1. One of my favorite chapters of the Bible. Ephesians 1. If you have your Bibles, turn there. I want you to listen. There's three times in the first chapter of Ephesians we get what the purpose of salvation is. Beginning with verse 5. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. Verse 6. To the praise of his glorious grace. Verse 12. So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. We're still in chapter 1 of Ephesians, verse 14. Who is a guarantee, meaning the Holy Spirit, of our inheritance until we acquire full possession of our inheritance. Here's what it says. To the praise of his glory. My daughter was four years old. And I don't take credit for this, but we drilled our kids a lot. So sometimes they said just what they heard from our lips. But I said to my four-year-old daughter, I said, who does God love most? And I was thinking she'd say, well, me. She said, no. He loves himself most. He must love himself. Now, I added this. He must love himself most. 
If God loves and values anyone above himself, he's guilty of idolatry. And that's what our Lord Jesus is praying here, that the glory that's due the Father's name and the glory due his name in obedience would come to pass to the praise of of his glory. Now we're going to get into some hard ones. If you're not listening, start listening now. Verse 2. Since you have given him authority over all flesh. You know that there's a lot of disputes in biblical theology. I think a lot of them are settled by a three-letter word called all. Look at verse 2. Since you have given him, who's him? The son, authority over all flesh. The plan of redemption includes, necessitates that the Lord Jesus be given all authority. <clears throat> Universal authority is what D.A. Carson calls it. The Father has given over universal authority <clears throat> over all flesh. It's a tremendous plan of salvation. It's going to be carried out by the Son who has all authority. But what does he have authority to do? How does it unfold? Here's where it gets sticky. To give eternal life to all whom you have given him. The extent of the authority is walked out to the point that the Father says, I'm going to give you the church as a gift. And so think about this. We're a gift. If you're a believer here, if you're born again, if you put your faith in Christ Jesus, you are a gift from the Father to the Son. And He gives you eternal life. Now we've heard this, haven't we? This idea of a gift. It's in 324 of Romans. You are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. John 15, 16. We're going to expand on that a little bit. We saw that, I think, two weeks ago, John 15, 16. Jesus says to his disciples, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. John 15, 19. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But you are not of the world. Why? Because I chose you out of the world. For what? Eternal life. Go back to your text. John 17. You have given him authority of all flesh to give eternal life. God chooses who he chooses. I don't know why he chooses who he chooses and who he doesn't choose, why he doesn't choose them. It's been a debate for what, ages. But here it is. I want the plain text of scripture to inform me that God chooses who he chooses. That's the way it's been from the beginning. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 7, 6 and 11. Through 11. For you are people, talking about Israel, holy to the Lord your God. The Lord has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Think about that. It was not, listen, because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on and chose you. For you are in fact the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out of the mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He's the faithful God. He keeps his covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. What am I saying? God chooses who he chooses, not because they're rock stars. Israel is no rock star. I'm no rock star. He chooses who he chooses because he gave the authority to his son to give eternal life. I don't even know who said this about the Jews being chosen. How odd that God would choose the Jews and how odd that he would choose me's and you's. Right? That is worth all of our praise. I, don't, I know I've heard it at least a dozen times. People have said to me, I could never believe in a God who chooses, he wants to choose, and he doesn't choose others. And I've attempted to say, you're getting close, because you could never believe, because God gives you faith to believe. 
He chooses who he chooses. And here he says, I will do it through my son, the gift of the church from the father to the son. Now, remember, this is a progression. Verse 3. He's filling out this, I think, the mind of his disciples. They're listening, like as this Ea Patton were speaking, and he says this, and this is eternal life. That's not a footnote. He's not saying, hey, I've got to add this, by the way. He's saying, no, and this is eternal life that they might know you. It's a logical progression. The word know is the word, you might know this, gnosko. It means intimate, experiential, careful. Oh. Intimate, knowing. Yeah. The logical progression to eternal life is that you have a new love, that I have a new love, that we have a new love corporately. And that's what brings us together. That's the very footing, I was going to say foundation, the footing which is under the foundation of our oneness that we all now belong to the Son. It is priceless. You can't buy it. That's why it says twice, a gift and given. Let me put it in different language. And I'm talking to me. When someone comes to this place of faith, and now they belong to Christ, I'm going to say it this way. It puts a fire in their bellies. That's the idea. It's visceral. It's inside. It's a part of us. It shapes us day to day. And it's what Jeremiah promised thousands of years earlier. Here's what he said. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel, the house of Judah, not like the old covenant that I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand, at the funny statement, took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant. Then he said, for this is the covenant that I will make now with the house of Israel. I will put the law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother Know the Lord, for here it is. They shall all know me. From the least to the greatest, declares the Lord. That's why I'm, I'm just flabbergasted sometimes by kids. Little ones. They barely, maybe they've made a profession of faith and they blow me away. Why? Because they're wise and smart and rock stars? No, because God gives it to them. I've been humbled by kids a lot. <laughs> they come up. So I'll tell you my favorite story. Friend of our family. His dad's a writer, Christian, been around for decades. His son gets his kite caught in the tree at about 5.30 at night. You know, it's like supper time. And he said, Dad, let's get my kite out of the tree. And his dad says, Matthew, that's his name, Matthew, that is not going to happen. We're going to have to get a ladder tomorrow, and we're going to have to climb the tree, and I'm not excited about this, and on and on, but now we're going to go eat supper, we'll think about it tomorrow. So his son says, well, have we tried praying? <laughs> and his dad said, no, I guess we haven't tried that yet. So they stopped and they prayed. That night, there's a small windstorm. And sure enough, you know the rest of the story. They come out the next morning, and the little boy says, Daddy, look what happened. And daddy says, yeah, I see it. <laughs> and I'm embarrassed by it. But do we have that kind of faith? And this is life eternal, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. John Owen said this about that. The greatest privilege in this life is to see the glory of God. I'm going to say it again. Here's what I said. The greatest privilege in this life is to see the glory of God. It even surpasses the Super Bowl. Sorry. For this is life eternal to know the Father, the only true God, and Jesus, whom he has sent. And then he says this, John Owen, unless you value this as a great privilege, you will never enjoy it. Isn't that interesting? That's insightful. Unless you value this as a great privilege, you will never enjoy it. 
So a little bit further, verse 4, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Isn't there an application there? His obedience is how he glorifies the Father. If you're wondering how you glorify the Father, if I'm wondering, and I go through these moments, go, am I really bringing glory to the Father? Here it is. Accomplishing the work that you're called to do. Are you a dad? Be a godly dad. Are you a mother? Be a godly mother. It's a season. They're going to be gone before you can say, Jack Robinson, they're gone. Time goes so fast. Are you an employee? There's all kinds of instruction in there. Be obedient to it. Do you have neighbors? Love your neighbors yourself. There's a book written at the beginning of the book that said, do you ever realize to love your neighbor may mean the guy who lives and gal that lives next door. <laughs> love them. Be obedient to that. Our calling in life. Our calling to love one another. Jesus said, I have glorified the Father by doing the work that you gave me to do. So petition number two. He's got a second petition. And then he goes on to pray for his disciples. And now, Father, glorify me. And he's got to be more pointed in your own presence with the glory that I had before the world existed. What's that? The eternal Son with the Father. How long? You know, Jehovah's Witnesses believe that the Son was created, that Jesus was created. He was a created offspring of the Father. You know what this does? It puts a kaput on it, right? Isn't that a good word? It's over and done. That I had with you before the world existed. Before the created world that we enjoy existed, they had something between them that Jesus longs to return to. And what is it? God's glorious presence. People through the years have said, well, God was actually obligated to provide salvation because he was lonely. <laughs> I'm going, no, he's never lonely. Blessed be the happy God. Paul wrote to Timothy. He's a happy God. He's infinitely happy. That's why he can give us joy. He's infinitely happy at the inner Trinitarian delight of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And what spills over from that unity and oneness is our joy. That's why Peter said, you're partaking of the heavenly nature. And so when we are in fellowship with God, and I would say that something even with one another, we're experiencing what the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit spilled over becomes for us. So back to the petition. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had before the world existed. If you want to put a word on it, infinite delight. The Son returns to the Father after, we call it the ascension. And he is now at the right hand of the Father, enjoying infinite delight. It tells us something else. The Christmas story we celebrate every year. That our Lord at least emptied himself of some of his glory. And he's longing and praying to get back into that fellowship. And there's, a, there's an amazing, I think, helpful thing for us. When we're in a fellowship with the living God, we ought to be like Jesus, and long and pray and even linger, loiter for a long time. Lord, bring me back into fellowship with you. I'm guessing that most of you are like me, a sinner. We have that in common. Sorry to profile you that way, but I'm guessing you are. And we fall out, and we begin to get so discouraged. It can take us in directions we never thought. I've seen people in a self-hatred that just perplexes me. But I think in part is because we become so discouraged, so undone, so shamed, so feeling guilty that we are stuck. And Jesus begins, I, I think at least gets us on a journey of beginning to see it for what it is. That that fellowship what we need, he didn't necessarily need it, but is like a reignited in God's presence. 
So what can we apply? How should I then, application, feel, feeling, doing, thinking, because of this prayer? Another application. The Christian has to realize, I dealt with this with one of my sons. He says, Dad, I feel so selfish when I'm always praying for myself. <laughs> and I'm saying, well, you better pray for yourself because I'm not praying for you. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> but you go through the Psalms and David at times seems so self-centered. But I think there's instruction. We must pray for ourselves. Because only you can pray for yourself, and I can only pray for myself in an informed way. I could tell you my prayer request, but that only tells you maybe a sliver of the story. So I think from Jesus we learn, we can begin to feel, here it is, comfortable about praying for ourselves. Particularly our spiritual health. What shall I do because of this prayer? I would hope that we would revisit this text and learn from the prayer life of the living Jesus, his longing that not only he would be glorified, but his father would be glorified. That's a lesson for us, how we pray for others. That that person, that child, that adult would in such a way experience the love of God that they're Life would be turned right side up because I am praying on a daily basis for them. So how do you reignite a prayer life? What I've tried to do is do flashcards. So some days I pray for my family, well, almost every day. And other things I pray for missionaries. I pray for River Ridge. And so we're, we're moving and not being so bogged down in prayer that, oh, I'm praying for the same thing all over again, but that we're diverse in a sense with our prayer life. Lastly, we're going to go to communion. How do I think about communion? Because of this prayer. And I'm going to ask the worship team to come up as we get into this last point. In a nutshell, Jesus is revisiting for his disciples and for us the redemptive story. They're taking in so much information. I wonder how they actually were able to take it all in. But I have pretty good evidence they did, at least one of the disciples. I'd like to share with you a little bit from 1 Peter chapter 2. And it does lay the groundwork for communion this morning. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. It's now actually become a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word. Take note of that. They were destined to do that, says Peter. Now, here's what I think Peter was really listening to the Lord in John 17. Here's what he says in 1 Peter 2, 9. But you, who? The church. Let this sink in. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That's your identity. A chosen race, royal priesthood, holy nation, a people for his own possession. Here's your activity. Here's our activity. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. How can that happen? Next verse, verse 10. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let's pray as we prepare ourselves for communion this morning. Our Father and our God, we know deep within our hearts that our righteousness is insufficient to bridge the chasm between us and the holiness and the perfection of our creator and sustainer. But you sent your only begotten son 
And you said, whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. And that well-known verse will bring us into communion this morning as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, remembering that our righteousness is insufficient, that for whoever would believe, you would impute your righteousness to them so they that might be justified, declared righteous before God. And so we're here to celebrate that this morning. To your honor and your glory, amen.